Thank you, David. That Ford's Theater pledge wasn't too painful, was it? <laughs> well, it is my privilege to be here tonight to speak with all of you. I did a little bit of looking back on the history of the Economic Club of Washington, which I understand has been around for about a quarter of a century. Uh, and in checking around on the history of the club and, and uh, kind of what its purpose is, I think it's apparent that it does play a valuable role in providing yet another a different and unique kind of a forum to uh, talk about the various issues in front of the nation today. I think its founders uh, understood that Washington's business community needed a place to discuss and debate the pressing policy matters of the day and understood that the decisions made in our nation's capital affect the long-term strength and viability of our economy. And I think the economic club over its history has risen to become a premier venue for discussing economic growth, job creation, and America's future. And for this reason, I can think of no better place and no better time to speak. The American people are looking for answers to re-energize our economy. Congress and the administration are debating policy options on a range of fronts including approaches to redu reduce the risk of climate change. And America's entrepreneurs and businesses are looking for sound, long-term energy and fiscal policies so they can invest in the future with renewed confidence. Today, I want to talk about the role America's energy industry plays in strengthening our economy, creating jobs, and generating value for the American people. It is a role that is often overlooked and, in my view, terribly underestimated. During the course of my remarks this evening, I'll discuss the importance of the energy industry to our economy, the growing demand for energy around the world, the most effective means to reduce emissions and other environmental impacts from energy use, as well as the need for putting in place public policies that spur investment and innovation to ensure we reach those shared goals. We meet, of course, at a time of tremendous economic challenge, not just in our nation, but around the world. Since December of 2007, when our current recession began, nearly 7 million Americans have lost their jobs. Thousands of small businesses have closed their doors. Many companies, large and small, have cut back on their investments in the future. And some of America's largest corporations have had to contend with bankruptcy and seek government aid. In addition, our state, federal, and local governments have experienced tremendous fiscal pressures as tax revenues have fallen and deficits continue to soar. Recently, financial markets appear to have stabilized. Energy prices are down from recent highs and worldwide energy demand has also eased. And the pace of job loss seems to have slowed. Yet despite these positive developments, Companies, workers, and consumers remain uncertain about the future. To recover from the recession, business and government must work cooperatively to restore that confidence. We will need investments and innovation from industry, and we will need sound and stable government policies that lay the groundwork for sustained growth in all sectors. For more than 150 years, the oil and natural gas industry has played an important role in America's economic growth. And it continues to help drive the U.S. economy by providing reliable energy, well-paying jobs, tax revenues, technological innovation, and shareholder value. According to a recent study by PricewaterhouseCoopers, the oil and natural gas industry contributes more than $1 trillion a year to the U.S. economy. This enormous contribution comes in the form of jobs, labor income, and the value added within our industry as well as in other industries that provide goods and services to support our activities. Or to put our contributions another way, the oil and gas sector is responsible for 7.5% of the country's total economic output. America's energy industry does not just provide financial strength. The energy sector is also a major U.S. employer. 
The oil and natural gas industry supports more than 9 million jobs in the United States, or about 5 percent of total U.S. employment. These jobs put more than $550 billion of income into the economy in 2007 alone. Of course, this contribution to American productivity and employment also strengthens our state, federal, and local governments. According to the U.S. Energy Information Agency, America's major energy producing companies paid or incurred more than $242 billion of income tax expense from 2005 to 2007. Last year, ExxonMobil alone paid more than $14 billion in state and federal taxes. Unfortunately, the oil and gas industry's enormous economic contributions are generally overlooked. Despite the billions of dollars in value and investments that are created and the millions of jobs that are supported, discussions about the energy industry focus almost solely on energy prices or quarterly earnings announcements. This misplaced focus often drives public policy in the wrong direction, hurting consumers and carrying adverse consequences for the entire economy. In recent years, this misplaced focus has led to higher taxes. Congress has enacted tax laws that are expected to cost the industry around $10 billion in additional taxes from what the industry would otherwise be expected to already pay. In addition, in the 2010 budget, the current administration has proposed new taxes and fees for the oil and natural gas industry, taxes and fees that could potentially total more than $400 billion over the next 10 years. Now, this probably sounds like some businessman engaging in complaint about taxes. My script says it is not. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm not going to read that part of the script because I am complaining a little bit. But, in fact, by the end of this speech, you're going to hear me proposing a new tax. Instead, what I'm pointing out is that care should be taken in adopting tax policies that arbitrarily punish investors or workers singling out any one industry. Such policies are usually counterproductive. They violate the principle of fair and equal treatment that is one of the great strengths of the rule of law and free markets. They place an undue burden on economic growth and they undermine job creation. Punitive taxes levied on the energy industry will ultimately raise cost for consumers, putting the highest burden on those who are least able to deal with higher energy costs, the poor and the low income. Finally, such punitive taxes would undercut America's future by hindering the ability of the U.S. energy industry to invest in new energy supplies and conduct the research and development necessary to develop new technologies, ceding that ground to foreign companies. Like few other industries, oil and natural gas production depends on consistent, disciplined, and substantial investments over a very long period of time. It takes years of planning and billions of dollars to complete a modern energy project, and projects can last for 75 years or longer. To give you an example, from 1983 through 2007, ExxonMobil made more than $355 billion in investments worldwide. Those investments exceeded our total cumulative earnings across the same period. Raising taxes and fees on the energy industry does not just endanger the investments in new energy projects. It also makes it harder for the energy industry to return value to our shareholders who can then reinvest that value into other segments of the economy. Nearly 55 million households have a mutual fund account, and 45 million households have IRAs or some form of personal retirement account. Millions of these households depend on the financial strength and performance of America's energy companies to protect their investments. What all these numbers show is that America's energy industry is a critical part of America's financial strength and its fiscal health. 
But even these data do not do justice to the important role that affordable, reliable energy plays in our economic growth. The fact is, affordable and reliable energy has a vast multiplier effect that helps every company and every consumer in the American economy. To understand the best policy course for harnessing, not hindering the strength of the energy industry, it is important to understand the realities governing the industry and the energy future we must face together. First and foremost, to grasp is the fundamental fact that global energy demand is set to grow, and it is going to grow significantly. As the International Energy Agency, along with almost any other think tank or any other government forecast you want to examine, predicts, the world's total energy demand will be significantly higher, about 35 percent higher over the next 25 years. And that's despite the current economic downturn. Since energy demand growth, such energy demand growth is actually good news. In developed nations, it promises greater access to the technologies and services that sustain our prosperity. Advanced computing, improved transportation, expanded communications, cutting edge medical research, and other modern advances rely on ready access to affordable and reliable energy sources. For developing nations, Energy offers something even more fundamental. It represents hope and opportunity. Energy means expanded industry, increased trade, and improved transportation, all of which create jobs that help people escape poverty. For rising nations, affordable, reliable energy is also vital to building new homes, schools, hospitals, and sanitation systems that can improve and save lives. We wish such progress for all people. This brighter future presents a challenge, however. To meet this enormous and growing demand for energy, the energy industry must operate at a size and a scale and over a long time horizon that for most people is simply too difficult to grasp. The world currently uses the equivalent of more than 230 million barrels of oil per day to fuel transportation, generate electricity, run farms and factories, heat and cool homes, and more. ExxonMobil is the world's largest publicly traded energy company, and yet we account for a mere 2 percent of the world's total energy. It is an enormous global energy industry. Not only is this an enormous challenge in terms of scale, it demands long-term planning horizons. Time in the oil and gas industry is not measured in normal business cycles, and it's certainly not normal measured in election cycles, but it is measured across generations. The energy we use today is the product of investment decisions, technical work that were made many years ago, even decades ago. In addition, for most nations, the energy that powers their economies requires a vast, complex infrastructure. New supplies of energy can come from hundreds, even thousands of miles away, often originating thousands of feet below sea level or drawn from layers of rock once thought impenetrable. To conquer such challenges requires long-term planning and effective risk management, especially as the world's energy resources are increasingly found in difficult or hard-to-reach places. And it requires an unprecedented level of new investment on the part of the world's energy sector. Again, the International Energy Agency estimates that the energy industry will need to invest more than $25 trillion in the world's energy supply infrastructure by the year 2030 to meet growing energy demand. These fundamental energy realities are important. For decades, they have shaped how our industry manages risk, plans for the future, and invests in new technologies. As energy demand grows around the world, these realities will become increasingly important. We will need to use them as the starting point as we work together to build sound and stable policy. In the decades to come, they will affect our economic growth, the environment, and our energy security. In short, our policy response will shape our future. 
The fact of enormous and growing demand for energy around the world means that the United States must pursue policies that allow us to develop energy from all available and commercially viable resources. We will need to increase the use of alternative energy sources, such as wind and solar. We will also need nuclear, hydroelectric, and geothermal power. In fact, all of these sources will help our economy as they become more efficient and they become more competitive with time. Developing all our energy resources will also require us to find and produce more oil and natural gas. Fossil fuels currently provide the vast majority of the world's energy. And due to their availability, their affordability, and their versatility, they will continue to do so. Oil and natural gas alone are projected to supply nearly 60 percent of the world's energy needs through the year 2030. With this increased energy demand, we also foresee a second part to the energy challenge, reducing greenhouse gas emissions associated with energy use. Globally, we expect energy-related carbon dioxide emissions to rise by an average of 1 percent per year through the year 2030. Much of this emissions growth will come from rapidly developed nations such as China and India. Meeting the challenge of reversing this trend in greenhouse gas emissions will require every nation, industry, and consumer to help. Our best hope for bringing change to the world's massive energy system is to harness the power of new technologies and free markets. By allowing nations and peoples to work together, we can invest in integrated solutions. These solutions leverage technology to expand energy supplies increase efficiency, and reduce emissions. Time and time again, our industry has proven that innovation and cooperation unleash human ingenuity and bring far-reaching technological advances that can transform the economy, protect the environment, and increase energy security. Let me provide just a couple of examples of how investing in integrated solutions can help society achieve our shared goals starting with recent advances in natural gas. For years, we have known that the United States holds vast quantities of so-called so tight gas or shale gas. This is natural gas that's locked in formations that are denser than concrete. But we did not have the technologies to extract this so-called tight gas in a cost-effective way until now. After more than a decade of steady investment in research and development, ExxonMobil and others have achieved breakthroughs with the invention of multi-zone stimulation technology. Now, this is a technology that allows us to stimulate, bust the concrete, and improve recovery from natural gas reservoirs previously thought to be economically out of reach. Here in the United States, in just one part of Colorado, it will allow my company to increase production by 300% providing enough energy from this one area to heat 50 million U.S. homes for 10 years. At the same time, this technology helps reduce environmental impacts, as we can now drill up to nine wells from a single point, allowing us to reduce our footprint so we don't impact the surface acreage as much. Also, by making greater supplies of cleaner burning natural gas available to Americans, this technology helps reduce greenhouse gas emissions in a substantial and meaningful way. Our long-term approach has also led us to invest in technologies that have promised to be truly transformative for the economy and the environment, even though they may be decades away. In July, you may have seen our announcement that we forged an alliance with the leading biotechnology firm, Synthetic Genomics Incorporated, to research and develop next-generation biofuels from photosynthetic algae. Certain species of algae can produce oils through photosynthesis that could one day be blended through our existing refining and supply network, converted into diesel, gasoline, and other products. If this R&D effort is successful, algae could play a role in expanding our transportation fuel supplies, and because algae lives by absorbing carbon dioxide, this revolutionary technology could also help us reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In addition, unlike first-generation biofuels, like those made from corn or sugarcane, 
Algae production does not rely on fresh water or arable land. So this next generation biofuel should have no adverse impact on food supplies. If the research and development milestones are met, we expect to spend more than $600 million on this project. That's just to prove the technology. If the technology is proven, then it will require billions of dollars more of investments to begin production on a commercial scale. These are just two examples of technological innovations. Over the last five years, we have invested more than $3.7 billion in research and development plot projects because we know making a steady and disciplined investment in innovation can help us and our customers increase their own efficiency and reduce emissions. In our industry, we understand that when it comes to achieving change at scale in the energy system, it requires long-term investments of time and money. This is why our nation needs energy policies that maximize the use of markets, minimize complexity, and this give the predictability needed to invest with confidence to develop the new technologies that are our best hope for a brighter future. Climate change policy is one example where such an approach is needed. As Congress debates important legislation for addressing the risk of climate change, we must remember the fundamental realities, again, governing the energy system. The need for and pace of technological change and the role of stable policies to encourage innovation, investment, and collaboration. When it comes to managing the risk of climate change, in my view, the most effective policy approaches must be guided by several key principles. First, a successful carbon reduction policy needs to establish a uniform and predictable cost for emissions for use in all economic decisions. This will ensure government is not put in the position of arbitrarily picking winners and losers. Second, the best way to ensure that carbon costs are minimized is to allow for markets to select the best methods to reduce emissions through new investments and in technology. Third, we should seek to minimize administrative complexity. Our shared goal is to reduce emissions at the lowest cost to society. To do that, we must keep administrative costs low so that market participants can invest in technologies that actually reduce emissions, not become bogged down in bureaucratic demands or incur the cost of financially burdensome regulatory systems. Fourth, we should seek to maximize cost transparency. By providing this transparency, companies and consumers can assess for themselves cost within the context of different public policy options, as well as then assess that cost against their own needs and their own available resources, allowing them to make the best decision possible for them. Fifth, our national policy approach should encourage global participation. Energy is critical to progress, to progress and economic opportunity in both developed and developing countries. Thus, for long-term emissions reductions to succeed, every nation must be involved. Developed nations cannot do it alone. Developing nations cannot be expected to forego economic growth and advancement. Thus, any carbon reduction policy must take these realities into account and encourage every nation to participate in the most appropriate way to meet our shared goals for reducing emissions globally. And of course, there will need to be periodic reviews and assessments to ensure that we can adapt to any changes in climate science that might emerge or to respond to any adverse impact that these policies may be having on economic performance. So how does the current proposal before the Congress to reduce carbon emissions measure up against these principles for effective policymaking? Will a cap-and-trade system accomplish our society's shared goals? Unfortunately, experience indicates that a cap-and-trade system will result in volatile prices for emissions allowances, and this volatility will carry a heavy cost for both the economy and the environment. For businesses and industry, price volatility undermines the ability to invest in advanced technologies. Price volatility also creates economic inefficiencies 
and invites ma manipulation in the markets for allowances. For businesses and entrepreneurs, the added complexity and lack of a predictable cost for emissions make it difficult to plan, especially over the long term. And as we discussed earlier, steady and disciplined investment is needed to develop and deploy new technologies. We are not alone in this assessment. The Congressional Budget Office studied cap and trade and concluded, I quote, volatile allowance prices could have disruptive effects on markets for energy and energy intensive goods and services and make investment planning difficult. Cap and trade schemes create another potential cost opportunities for market manipulation. Yet, even with regulations aimed at minimizing the potential for market manipulation, the volatility inherent in a cap and trade system will add to consumers' concerns about energy prices and the consumer's ability to manage energy-related expenditures. These costs and consequences inherent to cap and trade schemes have led many policy experts and economists to prefer another course of action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That other option is a revenue neutral carbon tax. I know that's hard for a politician to say. So we've given them a new name. They can call it a refundable greenhouse gas emissions fee. <laughs> now as a businessman, I have to take a deep breath every time I talk about this subject because it, it is very difficult for me to speak favor favorably about any new tax. So I hope you take it as an indication of how serious we think the issue is. A revenue neutral carbon tax, though, has the advantage of being well focused for achieving our society's shared goals of reducing emissions over the long term. It can be made predictable, transparent, and comparatively simple to understand and implement. A carbon tax can create a clear and uniform cost for emissions in all economic decisions. This encourages every business, every industry, and every consumer to become more efficient and do their part to increase efficiency and reduce emissions through other choices they might make. Because a carbon tax is directly applied to the carbon content of fossil fuels or to other greenhouse gas emissions, there is no need for government to pick winners and losers in the industry through, through such complex allowance and allocation processes as we have witnessed on the Hill of late. By eliminating price volatility, a carbon tax provides predictability. And predictability allows entrepreneurs and businesses to plan over the long term to research emerging technologies and develop the integrated solutions that have the most positive impact. A carbon tax also avoids the cost and complexity of having to build a new market for emissions allowances or the necessity of adding a new layer of regulators and administrators to police this market. And a simple carbon tax can be more easily implemented. It can largely be built on the existing tax infrastructure. We pay a lot of taxes, excise taxes, and other federal taxes today. We just add this one to the list. There's another advantage. A revenue neutral carbon tax can ensure that government policy is specifically focused on reducing emissions, not on becoming a revenue stream for other purposes. In other words, the size of government need not increase due to the imposition of a carbon tax to solve a threat to society. By returning the tax revenue back to consumers through reductions in other taxes, payroll taxes, or a simple dividend, we can reduce the burden on the economy and on our most vulnerable citizens. In this current economic downturn, the American families and businesses can hardly afford to be paying a higher cost for energy, so a direct and transparent refund mechanism is a political imperative. Finally, there is another potential advantage to the tax approach. A carbon tax may be more a more viable framework for engaging participation by other nations. A tax framework is easier to implement and it does not cap economic growth. In addition, it can be easily adapted to reflect the circumstances of each country. Given the global nature of the greenhouse gas challenge 
and the fact that the economic growth and development economies will account for a significant portion of future greenhouse gas emissions, policy options must be flexible in order to encourage global engagement. Now, some people have suggested that a revenue carbon tax has no chance of gaining sufficient support in Congress to become a law. They say a carbon tax is too politically sensitive and that it is easier and more politically expedient to support a cap-and-trade approach because the public will never figure out where it's hitting them. <laughs> They'll just know they hurt somewhere in their pocketbook. I disagree with this assessment. I believe the American people want climate policy to be transparent, honest, and effective. Economists generally agree that achieving a given emissions target costs less under a tax or fee approach than under cap and trade system. The system simply isn't incurring the transactional cost. So more of the cost of the economy goes directly to lowering emissions. I firmly believe it is not too late for Congress to consider a carbon tax as a better policy approach for addressing the risk of climate change. Indeed, there has never been a more opportune time for Congress to pursue this course of action. During this time of economic challenge, we must remember that our nation's economic growth and success are built on the innovation, energy, and ingenuity of the American people. In the months ahead, our nation will make many important decisions about the direction of our energy policies. The U.S. oil and gas industry, and I certainly can commit ExxonMobil, are committed to working with government leaders to help re-energize the economy, create new jobs, protect the environment, and strengthen America's energy security. We're going to continue to do our part to achieve all these shared goals by investing heavily even in the face of a down cycle, developing integrated technology-based solutions to our nation's economic and environmental challenges. And I'm confident with sound and stable public policies in place that these investments hold the promise for a brighter future for not just all Americans, but for the global community as well. I thank you for your kind attention. Have, uh, people can forward up some questions and then we'll, uh, Rex will ask, uh, answer some questions directly from the audience as well. I have a few here already. On the tax that you have proposed and advocated, are you involved in any lobbying effort now to try to get that through Congress and you think that's realistic? Well, we, we have been engaged in discussions with just about anybody that will listen to us, uh, both on the Hill as well as with the administration. Uh, we've talked about our view of the complexities of a cap-and-trade system uh, and, the, and the heavy burden of regulatory costs that we think comes with that system and all of the points that I just made. I think, David, what I'm, what I'm sensing is the Congress and the administration obviously have placed a high priority on this because the American people have placed a high priority on it. And I think they are searching for a solution that they would have confidence in is workable. And so we are getting a lot of interested inquiries about our views on the carbon tax, how we would structure it, and a lot of engagement over, well, what could we do to the cap and trade system to address some of these issues? And we've provided our views on what many people call hybrid type approaches, um, a cap and trade with some kind of a linked carbon fuel, uh, fee system, for instance. So we are, uh, we're engaged very heavily, I can tell you, through, through our own direct discussions. We're engaged heavily through many of the trade associations of which we are a member. Uh, we work with a number of broad-based organizations, certainly NAM, the Chamber, the Trucking Association, the Farming Association. As all of you can appreciate, this is an issue that will leave no American life untouched. Whatever we do, will change the life of every single American in one way or another. And so we do feel strongly that we need, to, we need to get this as right as we can, and one element of it that is really critical is to have a system in which you have some degree of flexibility as time goes by, so that as you are either achieving your goals or not achieving your goals, you can easily turn that knob 
back and forth and make vernier adjustments. And a tax is fairly simple to do that. You can turn it up a little bit if you're not achieving your goals and you think the economy can stand it, or if it's coming at too great of an economic cost, you can turn it down a little bit and still stay on a track of ever improving emissions reductions. A cap and trade system with the very complex transactional agreements that are in place now, these are contract agreements between counterparties, it's very difficult to intrude into that system and understand exactly how you're influencing it. The way the Europeans do it is they, you know, put credits in or take credits out. But there's so much opacity to that system, it's very hard to, uh, to predict exactly where does that manifest itself in the economy. So again, it's, it's all about keeping it simple, transparent. I think people make good choices when they understand the data. And the tax is pretty straightforward data. Let me ask you a question. Uh, when oil prices go up, it seems as at, at, at the pump, you recognize it pretty quickly. When oil prices go down, there seems to be a perception that <laughs> you don't recognize it quite. Is that a misperception or what? That's the market. <laughs> you know, all, the, the gasoline price that you see at your corner retail station is by and large a function of the competitive environment within that little region. And, they, and these regions could be as small as a few city blocks to as large as several counties, depending on the number of stations and the amount of competition. The flow through of prices uh, from the cost of the barrel of crude directly to the pump, uh, you know, is just a function of the supply chain. And when what's called the dealer tank wagon price, because that's what they're buying it in bulk, when those co higher cost barrels make their way through the system. Now, as the prices come down, it's the same thing. And a lot of that has to do with how the dealer deals with those lower dealer tank wagon prices he or she are seeing. And I don't think it should come as any surprise to people that oftentimes as the price is rising quickly on your, on your retail store, your mom and pop dealer at the corner, they simply can't push the price through fast enough. So there's a period of time when oftentimes they're making absolutely no money on the way up. Their margins are gone, and they're just taking the cash flow to buy the next more expensive tank wagon of gasoline so they can change the price. So on the way down, I think there, you know, there's a natural lag that occurs as they try to recoup some of their losses that they incurred on the way up. So it's kind of, if you think about the way you might run your business, you'd probably do the same thing. Now, at some point, they have to respond to the guy who's posting his sign down the street, or all of a sudden they look out in the pump island and there's nobody coming to the store. Okay. Um, next, it, uh, we have had a debate in our country about the need to reduce foreign oil. Uh, the great oil shock of 73, 74, we were importing about 35 percent of our oil. Now we're importing about almost 60 percent. Do you think it's a false debate to worry about foreign oil coming into the country, or should we actually try to reduce the amount of foreign oil coming in? Well, that's always been a, it's been a very perplexing question to me, because my, my automobile doesn't know where that barrel of oil came from. I mean, it burns a, a gallon of gasoline that was refined out of a barrel of crude from the west coast of Africa as well as it refines one from the Gulf of Mexico. And our economy doesn't really, other than the trade balance uh, flows, don't, shouldn't see that any differently than we do with any other trade issue. So I could ask you the same thing. Is it bad? Is it, a, is it negative for our economy and our national security to rely so much on in, imported sources of foreign capital? Asking me? <laughs> well, if I, if I can get a 20% uh, carried interest on it, it's okay. But uh. I think, you know, the, the real debate and the real issue ought to be how does that manifest itself in energy security? Because I think that's really the question that people are most concerned about is, is, our, is our energy security threatened because we are exposed to such a high level of imports? And um, my response to that is, well, the way you manage that threat is to ensure that you have as, as large a number and as diverse a number and sources of imported oil as you can make available to yourself. So don't cut any sources off. And the United States imports oil from about 35 countries. The two single largest suppliers of foreign oil to the United States are Canada and Mexico. Saudi Arabia accounts for a very small amount. The whole Middle East accounts usually at most for about 15 percent. 
and people are fixated on that part of the world for some reason, which also baffles me because they've been one of the most reliable suppliers of energy through wars, turmoils, coups. They've always kept it flowing. The only time it got cut off was when they decided to cut it off over a dispute. So I think the question really is let's keep the, the supplies diversified. It speaks for open trade. It speaks for maintaining good relationships among energy suppliers. They are as dependent upon us as a, as a consumer as we are upon them as a producer. And there is a natural codependency that exists in the consuming nation, producing nation supply balance. So I understand there's been a lot made of that. It, per, it, it really does perplex me. I don't understand it when you step back and look at it in the context of the fact that we've got 35 countries we can choose from. I don't know if you ever had a chance to talk to former Governor Palin about energy, but um, <laughs> on a, two Alaska issues. One, do you see Anwar as being a place where oil will ever be produced for the United States? And secondly, is there a realistic Alaska natural gas pipeline that's going to be built? Well, as to Anwar, I don't know whether any oil will ever be produced. Even if they let us go up and drill tomorrow, I don't know if there will ever be any oil produced because I don't know if there's any oil there. Uh, I've said for many years this whole conversation could be much ado about nothing. There may be nothing up there. We simply don't know. Uh, the only way to find out is go drill some exploration wells and then we'll know whether we've got something to argue about. Uh, if, it is, if there is all there and it's substantial and it's in the size of the resource, it's in a very difficult location, very high cost location, uh, then it likely would be developed and produced. But we really don't know what the resource endowment of Anwar might be. We know it's in a fairly limited area because we know where the geology should, uh, there should be the right kind of geology to have reservoir traps and source rock that we could have some oil or natural gas there. But, uh, you know, if and when we get around to that, that's a political question. As to the Alaska Natural Gas Pipeline, uh, I've told many people, I've, this is the fourth or fifth time I've tried to get Alaska Natural Gas Pipeline moving forward. I worked on it the first time back in the early 1980s when I was in the Exxon Company USA Natural Gas Department. This is an extraordinarily challenged project. The cost of the pipeline is upwards of $30 billion. It's to bring a supply of gas down to a single market, the United States, lower 48. We might be able to drop some off in Canada on the way, but they really don't need any because they're importing gas to us now. So it's a huge investment, and to make huge investments like that, and we were talking about this at dinner, I'm often asked, well, by people from Alaska, well, now, wait a minute, I heard you're spending $28 billion in Qatar to develop LNG. I just saw where you're part of this $40 billion project in Australia. How come you can't do this in Alaska? And the simple answer is, in both of those countries, they have given us 30 years of tax and royalty stability. They've said, here's the rules. We won't change them. The state of Alaska has never given us tax and royalty stability. And until they provide that, this, it's not financeable because no one knows how much money they're going to make if the state can change the tax rate on you at any given time. And the state of Alaska has changed our tax rate 22 times. They, they ratcheted it up pretty severely when the price of oil went high. They didn't bring it back down when the price of oil went low. And we, that's when I talk about stable policies in, in my remarks. You're going to go out and invest $30 billion, and you're going to take, it's going to take you about 10 years to build the darn thing, and then you're going to produce the first volume of gas to sell into a market that you have no idea what the price is going to be. You'd like to at least know that the state's not going to decide to double the tax rate on you the day you sell the first KCF. So that's been the real hurdle all along, has been getting stability uh, in the state of Alaska. We spent a lot of time talking to them about it. We're committed to work with them around a the structure. We want it. We want it as badly uh, as they do, because we want to see this resource brought on the market for the, uh, for the consumers here in the U.S. Okay. Let me ask you, for our guests uh, who might have some extra money to invest in the stock market or <laughs> elsewhere, if they wanted to invest in the energy world, other than your stock, where would you say they could make a good profit in investing in energy? What areas do you recommend? David, that's why I just run an oil company and okay. All don't, right. I, don't, I don't run an investment house. Okay. Well, let me ask good. you. Go ahead. <laughs> um, uh, before you became CEO, Exxon Valdez was a, uh, a national problem, of course, when it uh, uh, um, had the spill. What has Exxon and other oil companies done, or what have they done, to prevent that type of problem occurring in the future? 
Well, the Exxon Valdez was a, uh, first a national and state tragedy, but it was also an extraordinarily emotional event inside of Exxon. I can tell you that because I lived through all of it. Uh, what it motivated us to do was to completely change the way we deal with risk management. And out of that incident uh, was an extraordinary effort to create what is called today our operational integrity management system. At the time it was, it was uh, called something else, but it has evolved over the last 20 years and it is a very detailed approach to how we manage all elements of risk in our business the world over. And it has done the same way, it doesn't matter where you are. And the benefit of that is, has been that as we, as we move people around the world from pay, place to place or we go into a new place, we take this system with us and we don't have to create something from scratch and our people don't have to wonder how we're going to manage risk when they go from one part of the world to the next. The execution of that system is what has changed the way we manage risk and it's why we have not had, uh, for, for several years, for about 10 years, our average marine spill was a teaspoon per million barrels that we transport. We have not had a spill of even a teaspoon size since the fourth quarter of 2006. And these are little drops that come off the hose when you disconnect. We don't have those anymore even. So it has changed dramatically the way we manage that risk and that has been picked up throughout the industry and it has changed dramatically. Obviously technology has helped us, new systems have helped us, better materials. Uh, the fleet is being changed out to double hull tankers, which, is, which of course gives you another barrier against risk mitigation. Uh, my view of that is if you, know, you don't want that to be your only protection. Right. You better have some very good systems in place as well. So it was, a, um, it, it was a lesson that was hard learned by us and the industry as a whole. And it's one that, uh, you know, that we look back on and, re and remind ourselves of all the time. Okay, uh, another question is, um the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, when you're competing against foreign companies around the world, is the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act a, a real handicap for you and your and American companies, or is it something that uh, is not a big handicap any longer? Well, uh, let me think about how to answer this question exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's irrelevant to us because the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act is the law and we're going to abide by the law. And so, if you are in a situation, and we are in these situations all the time, and I have personally been in situations in dealing with uh, foreign governments where as a condition of the deal, they introduce some aspect that they say, well, to get the deal done, then now you need to do this and this. And we quite frankly just say at that point, well, look, we can't, we can't do those things. We're not going to do those things. And if that's the basis of the deal, then I guess ExxonMobil in your country can't do business and we just have to get up and walk away. And we do that more often than, than probably people realize. Now the interesting part of the rest of the story is that more often than people probably realize if a little time goes by and that government calls us back and they say, how come you haven't come back to see us? And we said, well, we told you we, you know, we can't do the deal under the terms. They said, well, you need to come back and talk to us. And we pick the conversation up and those questions are never asked of us again. Okay. So in, I think in some governments there's a bit of a testing goes on and because it's not illegal for companies from certain countries to engage in certain activities, the governments just want to ensure they're getting everything they can get. But when they understand we can't do that, if the deal is sound and they really want us there, then we get the deal done and we don't have those issues. We have questions from the audience. Uh, people raise their hands. There should be some mics floating around. Anybody have a question? Anybody? There must be some. Nobody? Must be some question somewhere. The one in the back. Somebody. Sorry? In the back? Yeah, back. Okay, sorry. Somebody's waiting on a mic. Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Dan Witten with Bloomberg News. Oh. I wonder if the, uh, the other let us in here. <laughs> Did they let you eat anything? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> You don't have to worry about that. We're still hungry. <laughs> I just want to make sure they weren't going easy on you. <laughs> so the Senate, uh, some senators just came out with their bill yesterday. EPA just came out with a rule. And uh, I'm wondering if you can comment on uh, 
the specific impact that's going to have on you and if you can say anything about what that might do to the price of a gallon of gasoline. Well, I, and I'll be honest with you, I've not had a chance to read in detail uh, the Kerry Boxer bill. I know they have introduced it. I know some of the basics of what's in that bill uh, and have followed what the EPA has, has talked about doing. Uh, in terms of the, Im the impact of any type of climate legislation business, we, we already, when we evaluate our investment decisions going forward, we have for some time included an assumed cost of carbon in all of our investments, you know, working on the basis that we think legislation is going to move forward. And so our investments have to bear the cost of that. Uh, I'm not going to share with you what that assumption is because I don't want to give anybody a price to shoot at. But, uh, but we do have it in there. So uh, clearly some certain types of projects uh, can be, are made uneconomic or they're put at the margin. Now what that sends us off to do when that happens is we send our technologists and our project engineers back to the drawing board and we say, okay, the, if this is the element that's putting it beneath our investment criteria, you've got to go find a way to improve that situation. So you've got to figure out how to get cost out of it somewhere else. You've got to find some technology solutions. But if, if we're going to invest in this project, you know, you've got to give me a better, better plan than you have now. Uh, and that's no different than the way we deal with any other risk element of projects. So this is just another element of risk that we manage when we make investment decisions. It doesn't fundamentally change the way we do things. There's no doubt there'll be some things at the margin that will no longer be economic unless our guys, our folks, our bright people can figure out a way to claw that value back. And they're pretty good at doing that. Uh, in terms of what it would mean for price at the pump, that is entirely a function of what the price of carbon, where they set the price of carbon. Uh, so, you know, it's hard to say what the effect would be until you know what the carbon price is. Do you, we haven't built a refinery in this country in decades. Do you think it's possible to get a refinery built here, or do you think it's not even worth pursuing any longer? Well, the, I think the real question, David, is do we need any more refineries? Uh, the last refinery built was in 1973 by Marathon. We built the next to the last refinery in Joliet, Illinois in 1972. So we have the second most modern refinery in the U.S. <laughs> we were talking about this over dinner, in fact, and I think what a lot of people don't appreciate is that while there have been no new greenfield sites built, within the fence lines of the existing refining system in the United States, there has been enormous modernization, upgrading, improvements over the years which is why we've been able to meet this rising demand for gasoline and products without any new refineries. In the case of the Joliet refinery, as I mentioned, the last one we built in 1972, it was built to refine at a capacity of about 150 to 160,000 barrels a day. Today, that same refinery, same footprint, largely the same vessels, processes almost 280,000 barrels a day. And that's just through technology improvements and engineering and science and things we learn how to do with the pots and pans to get more out of it. So I don't, I think the question is do we need any more? And the answer to that is we think likely not. Motor gasoline demand in the United States peaked in 2007. And of course we've had this economic correction. But before the economic correction, our outlook predicted that motor gasoline demand would peak in the United States in 2007 and start a long steady decline. Our current outlook is 2007, we were using about 20 million gallons, uh, 20 million barrels a day of gasoline. In 2020, we'll be using about 17. And that's, that's a result of several things happening. The increasing volumes of biofuels, ethanol and biodiesels and things that are out there are taking up some of that demand space. But there's an, e there's an enormous improvement in energy efficiency in the fleet. Now the, the fleet, the motor vehicle fleet has been improving at about one and a half percent per year for the last 25 years. But the average fuel economy line has stayed flat. And the reason is because the automobile industry has taken all the energy improvement in the fleet and plowed it back into heavier vehicles and more horsepower because that's what the consumers wanted. The advent of the SUV. So they were able to keep the average fuel economy number flat through engine economy improvements, which they then put back in through more weight and horsepower. We think going forward that because of the emphasis on energy efficiency, uh, ongoing improvements in vehicle mileage standards, as well as a changing mix over time of hybrid or hybrid-like vehicles, 
that motor gasoline demand is down. It's headed down. It's going to continue to head down. So we probably have plenty of refining capacity is my observation. When you're driving along and you stop and need gasoline and you stop at an Exxon uh, station, do you ever tell them who you are? Or do you ever, uh, <laughs> do, do they recognize you? or? You ever I don't want to give them a heart attack. <laughs> 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 what I've learned is if they, as soon as I walk in and occasionally from time to time, a store manager, particularly in the stores that we own, which we're not going to be owning very many any longer, but they'll recognize me and the interesting thing I see, I see them immediately run to the bathroom to see if it's clean. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, one more question, uh, John. Yeah, John Colby. You haven't mentioned OPEC tonight. What's your view on OPEC and what is it more or less going forward? Well, OPEC uh, today, as you know, they've had a curtailment in place now for about a year and a half. Uh, that compliance with that curtailment has been extraordinarily good. At one point, they had about 82% compliance, which is very good for OPEC. It's running about 65% now. When the price of oil got back up above 70, some people just can't help themselves. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, OPEC, uh, as an entity, continues, I think, to play you know, the role they want to play. They, do, they have continued to invest in capacity. Uh, so again, kind of back to this concern people have over foreign imported oil. Saudi Arabia has invested billions and billions of dollars to increase their capacity to now 12 to a little over 12 and a half million barrels a day. It was at about 10. They did that so that the world will have reliable supplies and so they can take advantage of the demand when it's there. Now they are sitting on about almost 4 million barrels of shut-in spare. Now, I don't know very many people in the business community that can invest that kind of money and then shut the capacity in. So they play a useful role in that regard in that within OPEC today there is, among all the OPEC countries, there's somewhere between five to maybe six million barrels a day of spare capacity that is shut in. Uh, inventory levels are at record highs around the world for crude oil supplies, for motor gasoline, for heating oil, there is a, more than 110 million barrels of oil floating on the water with no place to go. So there's a huge supply overhang out there, and I think from OPEC's perspective, they've invested a lot of money, and they would like to be able to sell some of the capacity they've invested in. Uh, in terms of their, you know, are they relevant today? Of course they are. They are still the swing suppliers in the world, and they are willing to play that role. Okay, well, thank you very much, Rex. Appreciate it. Let me give you this uh, gift here. Thank you. thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right, appreciate it. It was very good. Very good. Thank you. We uh, have coffee and cordials in the back, and please uh, join us back there. Thank you all very much.